Welcome to our first mnemonic walkthrough. Consider these section wrap-up videos to always be 100% optional. I find it fun to make these stories in a visually connected location to help me lock in those newly learned mnemonics. But I know this kind of a thing is more helpful for some than it is for others, so I don't expect these walkthroughs to appeal to everyone. But that said, if this is your thing, then you should try to imagine this whole story again tonight, right before you fall asleep. And you'll probably remember the mnemonics and possibly the way everything was connected, but challenge yourself to try to remember what the concepts are that those mnemonics represent. And then once that becomes natural, it'll be hard not to make the jump when you see those objects in everyday life. From that point on, it's easy sailing because you'll be learning amazing concepts through effortless associations. And that's the goal. Now this may look like a regular old Las Vegas casino from the outside, but it's not. On the inside, imagination runs the show. There's no end to the bizarre, the unexpected, and the oh-so-memorable stories that are constantly taking place in this memory palace. Let us approach with caution. Let me take you over here. I want to introduce you to Sam Flynn. He's famous from the Tron movies. Him and his light cycle that leads a trail behind it everywhere it goes at high speeds. Right now, he's feeling pretty depressed. He's slumped over, sitting here on the curb because, well, he's ruminating. And he needs to stop ruminating on the fact that his newest movie kind of sucked. I mean, it had cool visuals and it was, you know, fun and great music, but, you know, the acting was kind of weak. It's not really a story. It could have used some work. And that hurts him a lot. But a solution is at hand because... A python snake politician is just pulling up right next to him, and he hops out of his car and he says, Flynn, I can give you $200 million right now to make another movie if you are willing to take that Tron light cycle all the way to the border and make a wall between Mexico and America for me. As a politician, I need this wall up now. Can you do it for $200 million? Well, Sam Flynn looks at him, and he's not depressed anymore. He jumps up, happy and rich. He says, Mr. Politician, I will take that money, and he does. And then he hops on his light cycle, and he heads off towards Mexico, the whole way leaving a long wall behind him. And now we follow this python snake politician. Let's find out exactly what he's doing here. Oh, looks like he's sitting down at a table with a whole bunch of other politician snakes. Uh, and he's telling him the good news. Oh my, they seem like they're actually not that happy. He got the wall built for $200 million. Let's listen in closer. They're all wiggling their tongues at him. And they're expressing their anger with their tongue hissing. It's very weird, and he doesn't like it. So we ask these snake politicians, what's the problem? And they say... The problem is that none of us want to see another stupid Tron movie made. In fact, we all hate the franchise so bad that we were planning to move to Mexico if they made another movie. And now you've just given him the money. And the worst part is we can't even get to Mexico because your dumb wall's in the way. This is a problem. But luckily, our python snake politician is feeling smug. He's feeling smart and he's on a roll. He says, listen, you snaky snakes, this is not a problem. Let's just reallocate the U.S. government's $600 billion military budget to NASA, and then we can all move to Jupiter. It's a whole planet where there's no Tron. Everyone is so happy now. All of the snakes are, are wiggling their tongues in a different way now, and this, this kind of wiggle... <laughs> <laughs> and this kind of wiggle means that they're happy. It's like this is wiggling up and down, which is like to show they're happy. The other one was wiggling left and right, which is like hissing out of anger. So now they're really happy and they're wiggling their tongues around. And all of the snakes put on space helmets and hit the dance floor right over here to jam out to some music. 
So the snakes come over here and they're dancing. And at first they're really pleased because hanging here right in the middle of the room from the ceiling is a giant model of Jupiter, about the size of a disco ball. And they think that's really cool because that's where they're all going to live when the new Tron movie comes out. But then they didn't really think about it. But because it's not making cool lights like a disco ball would everywhere, it's kind of kind of ruining their dance vibe, you know? And the snakes, they really love dancing with the disco lights everywhere. But these snaky politicians definitely know how to fix problems like this by taking illegal drugs. That's right. Illegal drugs that make it so that anything they do will seem fun. But only in the short term. In the long term, they'll do serious damage to their body. And it's a really bad move overall. But because these are just snake politicians who aren't really thinking of long-term goals and they're always trying to do whatever feels best at the moment they're always trying to cater and pander they do it and when they come off that drug they regret ever doing it and then feeling sick and tired they all make their way out this front door to go back to running our country <laughs> Now, the bartender that works the afternoon shift over here is one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. After stopping Shredder and not getting married to April O'Neil, he didn't really know what to do, so he just got a job bartending. Well, he figures himself out, you know? But the problem is now that he's just bored. He's been, like, sitting here for a while, and those snake, those snake politicians didn't really order any drinks because they were, you know, on their illegal drugs, and... You know, the other guy who was going to get a drink from Tron, like, went off to Mexico. So he decides, well, he's killing some time. He's going to look over his report card. So he takes his most recent report card, which he hasn't looked at yet, and lays it right here on the counter. And he starts looking over his grades. Some A's, some B's, and a few C's. He's thinking about how his GPA is mutable and changing over time. And he looks up to see a potential customer as a small butterfly flutters in the door, looking like he's ready for a drink. Now, this butterfly has had a long day at work, a long week at work, actually, and all sorts of additional stresses in his life from multiple factors. And today, he just wants to relieve this overworked tension with a shot. So he comes over to the Ninja Turtle bartender and he flutters right here onto the counter and says to the Ninja Turtle, I would like a shot. I've had a stressful week. The Ninja Turtle says, I hear you, man. I hear you. What'll it be? And the butterfly looks at all of those choices. And as if he didn't have enough stress in his life, now he has to decide from one of these drinks when there's so many. He's got to weigh the options, the prices, the tastes. The types. So he says to the Ninja Turtle, look, man, I'm at my wit's end. Being a butterfly is not as easy as you'd think, and I don't feel like making this decision. Can you help me? And the Ninja Turtle says, of course I can. What we'll do is we'll break down the approach first by type and then by brand. Great, says the butterfly. So the Ninja Turtle says, now, do you like vodkas? Do you like whiskeys? Or do you like tequilas? And the butterfly says, you know what? I think it's a whiskey day. Whiskey it is. So we don't need any of these or any of these. That leaves us with just these three options. We have Jack Daniels and two others. I don't really know that many whiskeys. So now, which one of these three specific liquors would you like? Which one of these three specific liquor brands and the butterfly says, now that, I can choose between three. I'll take Jack Daniels. He pours him a shot of Jack Daniels. That butterfly slams his hand down on the counter, takes it in one gulp, and says, man, that hit the spot. He flutters up, a little more wobbly this time, and gives that Ninja Turtle a big kiss on the nose, a big butterfly kiss. And then he flutters out the front door to go do whatever butterflies do when they're happy because he's now feeling great. Now follow me right over here to this foosball table. I want to introduce you to two professional streakers. Now right now, they're not in the best mood. They're here playing on this foosball table because, well, they feel a bit defeated. Both of these guys are professional streakers and what they love 
more than anything, what their passion, what they were put on earth to do was run naked in front of big crowds of stadiums. But unfortunately, they're unable to pursue their dream, their American dream, because all of the nearby stadiums have 86 them and they are no longer welcome in any of the nearby stadiums. And this hurts. Could you imagine the thing that you love doing being banned by every place where you can do it? That's what these two streakers are dealing with right now. So they're playing foosball. They're not even really trying to score. They're just imagining what it would be like little versions of them to run across this little thing here naked. Like they're just imagining streaking on this foosball table and big audience of tiny people around the foosball table grossed out at watching them be naked, but some cheering them on as they get tackled. But then, in the middle of the depression, one of them looks up at the other and says, you know what? I just thought of a solution on how we can get back into the stadiums. And the other says, well, what? What is it? And he said, I know. I have some of those my name is sticker badges from a lame corporate event. Why don't we put new names on them, names that aren't ours, and then we'll stick them to our chest, and the security guards won't know that we are the ones who were kicked out before. Oh my gosh, the other streaker is so excited. He didn't even think about that. He's got a new name. He's, the new name's not kicked out. They'll let him into the stadium. And then, once they get in the stadium, they can run naked. And everyone in the audience can watch them get tackled. They jump for joy, hug each other, and then they head out to the nearest local football match, excited to execute on their new plan. And as they run out the door, they run past the penguin encounter, which is also going to be our final story for today. Now, this penguin enclosure has many penguins, just like in a zoo, where they're on a fake little ice ledge, and there's like a refrigeration system in there so that it's all cool and cold and like the Arctic for these penguins. But the problem is these penguins have been stuck in this enclosure for tourists who come to the gold spike to look at for a long time. And, you know, they're feeling kind of confined. It was cool for a while, but now they're kind of wondering what's beyond the scope of this enclosure. So the problem is that the bar management at this bar is trying to appeal to a more upscale crowd. They don't want lowlifes coming into this bar. So they brought in all of these penguins because all of the penguins look like they're wearing tuxedos. And they thought that the customers would see the penguins wearing tuxedos and think that they needed to, you know, at least dress nice. Maybe not all the way to a tuxedo, but you don't want to be wearing shorts when everyone else has a tuxedo on. And the logic is sound. But the penguins, they need some freedom. And now the penguins have an idea. They look at the bar manager and they're always so fancy pants, like they're holding drinks and like they talk really fancy because, you know, they're fancy people. But they decide that they're going to start acting like lowlifes. And when the bar manager sees that, he's going to say, get the heck out of here, penguins. We're trying not to keep your kind around. We're trying to get classy kind. That's why we brought you in. So when they see the bar manager walk over to feed them, the penguins start burping, chewing with their mouth open, and other low-class things that I can't think of right now, maybe smelly armpits and stuff. And when the manager sees this, he is so disgusted. He opens the enclosure immediately and lets them run free. He says, we don't need you low-life penguins here anymore. And they're so excited, they run right out the door to explore all of Las Vegas. The penguins are now free. Finn. Subscribe to the New Monic Academy YouTube channel for daily uploads that will help you learn amazing concepts through effortless associations.